on the proposed amendments to the Domestic Violence Act. And we have um, as our um, speaker this afternoon, someone that started our very first series of webinars right at the beginning, uh, Ms. Karen Lee. And Karen is the um, Advocacy Policy and Research Officer um, at Mosaic Training Services and Healing Center. So we just want to welcome Karen back and say thank you so much for making yourself available. Welcome Karen to um, proceed to she. Um, if I can just reiterate, please do keep yourself muted during the session. It will help with your bandwidth, your cameras um, off. Um, we will have a question on session um, fairly, uh, fairly soon. And um, if you do have any questions um, while Karen is presenting, please do um, post your questions in the chat box and we will keep looking at the chat box and we will then be able to um, ask um, questions. If I do miss it because I'm doing this from my phone, so I may not always pick it up immediately, um, then just sort of remind me when we do get to the question and answer session. Um, but thank you once again for joining. Karen, um, if you're ready to proceed, thank you so much and um, you may continue. Thank you so much, um, Lizelle. Um, I'm just going to work out how to share my screen quickly. Um, it doesn't seem to want to give me the window for my presentation. Um, so let me first, just while I'm trying to figure that out, just uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. It's fantastic to be back with you, and especially on a topic such as the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill and the proposed amendments. Um, it's something that we've been looking at for quite a while now um, and, and something that we definitely welcome. The process of amending the Domestic Violence Act is something that's been called for for, for a number of years now. So it's great to see it um, in fruition in front of Parliament and ready for um, another round of submissions that close on Friday. So we, we're really looking forward to finalising this bill. Um, yeah, just give me one second. I just want to see if I can do a screen share. Otherwise, you're going to not be able to uh, not have anything to focus on while I present. So um, let me see if this allows me to do it. I had no uh, problems sharing before, so I'm not too sure. Yeah, no, it's not allowing me to. Um, so I, I I apologize for that. I'm not 100% sure why it's not allowing me to to share that. Um, but what I will do is maybe just go ahead and start with the presentation. And if I can figure it out during the course of, then um, I will most definitely share that. So apologies for that in advance. Um, so I was asked to to present today on the proposed amendments for th that um, of the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill. Um, it's currently out for comment, <clears throat> and it's it really is looking at um, how do we better protect um, victims of domestic violence uh, through the Domestic Violence Act and making the protection orders um, more, um, more effective in being used by, by complainants. So, so the, I've, I've categorized the proposed amendments into eight categories, um, and these really are focused on the definitions relating to domestic violence, protection orders themselves, so that covers the, the serving as well as the um, as well as the applying for protection orders, then some of the changes that are proposed for courts and the court processes, um, looking at police and their role, then also around a minimum sentence for offences for breaching of protection orders, and then quite a, a quite a contentious, if I can call it that, addition to, or the proposed amendments and addition to the, the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill is around obligation to report or, or mandatory reporting. And then looking at some of the additional stakeholders that have been included and then, um, yeah, and then a couple of other um, sort of general amendments. 
So if we look at the definitions relating to domestic violence, and again, I apologize that you can't see my slides, but what I will do is I will share it um, with Lizelle and John after this so that um, you can at least have something to refer back to. So if we look at some of the definitions relating to domestic violence um, we, and the forms of domestic violence, we've seen a couple of inclusions. Um, here we've seen the expansion of um, the, the form of, of domestic violence to include the complainant's workplace and place of study. Um, before, this was really um, focused on residential or, or home uh, where the respondent was not currently living. Um, then there's also the inclusion of coercive behavior. Now, this is something that was a little bit open to interpretation before when somebody came in to apply for a protection order and explain coercive behavior. There wasn't really a definition in the act to say this is what coercive behavior is. So this has now changed in the amendment bill and the addition of coercive behavior, um, which states that it means any abusive conduct or acts of force, intimidation, or undue pressure intended to cause a complainant or a related person to act, not to act, or be subjected to certain acts against his or her will. Now, quite closely linked to coercive behavior is controlling behavior, which has also been a welcome addition to the, um, to the bill. And this really talks to controlling behavior, meaning the cause means causing the complainant or related person to be dependent on or subordinate to the respondent by. And then there's a list of, of things that could be done um, that would equate to controlling behavior. Then there is also the addition of violence against a related person. Now, this is something that wasn't in the previous act, but is now included. And what it really says is that in a domestic violent relationship, for those of you that were, were in my first presentation I did at the start of the series of webinars, if we look at the nature of domestic violence, it's really about power and control. So often somebody who is perpetrating violence would use a related person as an instrument of abuse. So that could be fine, I'm not going to abuse the complainants or the applicants, but what I will do is I will threaten or I will perpetrate violence against a person such as a relative, a child, or um, even somebody who may be assisting that person and quite closely linked to the instance of, of violence. And then there was a large proportion of the um, definitions that were dedicated to electronic forms of abuse. Now, we know we live in the digital age where, where things are no longer necessarily said in um, necessarily said in um, in writing or verbally, but it's done via WhatsApp or via email or using social media. Um, so that's been quite a large proportion and dedicated in the um, in the definitions to electronic forms of abuse. And what we'll see later when we talk about stakeholders, also quite a large responsibility put on um, mobile communication providers, service providers, uh, to supply information when needed. Then one of the things that uh, the bill has, has tried to do is also to align itself with other pieces of legislation. So, for instance, if we look at the Children's Act in the Domestic Violence Act, it has now been explicitly recognized that any acts of domestic violence um, or violence or other harm perpetrated against children is now explicitly recognized as domestic violence. And this includes the exposure to violence. Um, so children who live in a domestic violence home and are forced to, to view violence perpetrated against one of their parents or um, one of the, the people inside the home, that is also included as a form of domestic violence. Um, then other proposed um, amendments in the, in the definitions is we see an inclusion of elder abuse, and this is obviously aligned with the Older Persons Act. Um, we've seen the removal of stalking, and this has really been replaced by an expanded definition 
definition of harassment, which is aligned with the Protection from Harassment Act. Um, it just may be a little side note here on stalking, is that if we look at the current understanding of, of stalking and harassment, I think there will need to be a lot of work done around community engagements and education so that the, the word stalking is understood to to uh, be similar to, to harassment because the word stalking or the understanding of stalking is something that is used quite um, regularly by, um, by domestic violence victims. And then there, there's also the inclusion of a de definition of spiritual abuse, and that's something that we, we definitely welcome. Um, and then the proposed, there is also a proposal to limit the definition of a domestic relationship to one where a complainant and respondent have shared the same residence in the last 12 months. Um, now this, this definition while we can see the the intention we also understand that the nature of domestic violence extends outside of of the same residence it's something that could happen for many many years so we were a little bit concerned about the um the limitation of this being to a relationship in the same residence in the last 12 months um then, I mean, so so that's really the main points in the um, in the expanded definitions. I am welcoming anybody who's worked on the on the bill and the submissions. If there's anything you think that I have missed out in terms of definitions, please do um, please do do comment on that as we as we move forward into the question and answer session. Um, but the next section I want to to move on to is um, section uh, two in the bill that speaks to um, obligations to report. And here we, um, we're looking at obligations to report in two ways. The one is obligations of functionaries to um, relating to domestic violence. Now a functionary is defined in the act as, or sorry, in the bill, as either a medical practitioner, a health service practitioner or provider, a social worker, an official in a public health establishment, an educator um, or a caregiver. Now, in the bill under Section 2A, it states that if a functionary becomes aware of the facts or on reasonable grounds, believes or suspects that a child, a person with a disability, um, or a person with a disability is a complainant or where the complainant is an adult, the functionary has a duty to report in a prescribed manner to a social worker and the South African Police Service. Um, the section goes on to also include that there, um, after a, an assessment and um, after a screening and assessment and an evaluation, there, there can be referral to other services or the provision of other services, but the main section that is focused on here is really about um, the obligation to report to a social worker and the, the South African Police Service. Um, subsection five of the section states that if a functionary or a functionary who fails to comply with the um, obligation to report will be guilty of an offence. The second section or section 2B um, that looks at mandatory reporting looks at the obligation to report domestic violence and to provide information. Now this section applies to an ordinary adult person. It's no, now no longer um, only linked to um, people working in a helping profession, but to any adult person. And again, here it states that an adult person who has knowledge or a reasonable belief or suspicion that an act of domestic violence has been committed against a child, a person with a disability or an older person, or has knowledge that an act of domestic violence has been committed against an adult in a domestic relationship, must report such knowledge as soon as possible to a social worker or the South African Police Service. The, the Act again, or the bill again, it does make provision for protection under um, 
under the disclosure of personal information if it is if such report is made in good faith. But just as with the functionaries, a person who fails to comply to um, with the obligation to report and provide information will be found guilty of an offence. Um, now, when I was asked to do this presentation, I was also asked to provide a little bit of insight into what some of these provisions or what some of these proposed amendments, um, what impact they could have on victims of domestic violence. Now, this particular um, proposed amendment uh, to the bill is is incredibly concerning for us as an organization who provides such um, services to domestic violence victims. And our concerns are based on, on a couple of things. The one is around placing a duty to report on all adult persons. Um, and here our, our concern is that we will be limiting or reducing access to help for women who, and I say women uh, because we know that predominantly um, people who seek assistance for domestic violence are women, but anybody who is experiencing domestic violence, it, an obligation to report and with the the threat of being convicted or, or criminally liable does uh, reduce the amount of help available to victims of domestic violence. And we, again, if, if you were part of that first webinar where I expressed the the pattern that a victim of violence would go through before seeking help, this really, really um, has large reaching implications for A, for people offering to help and B, for, for, um, for complainants actually seeking um, assistance. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, to chat a bit more through that during um, the question and answer session. Um, so the, then if we move on to looking at the police, some of the main amendments in the, in the, um, the bill look at um, there is now provision made for a peace officer, as it's stated in the bill, for arrest to be made by a peace officer without a warrant. Now, um, this is subject to a peace officer being at the scene of an incident of domestic violence and being able to make an arrest at the scene without a warrant if there is if they reasonably sus suspect um, a respondent of committing, of having committed an act of domestic violence. Um, so that's something that wasn't there before. And it's something that would have a very positive effect on victims of violence who are not in, um, who, who do not have a protection order with an attached warrant. So now there is, um, scope for police to arrest on suspicion of an act of domestic violence without a warrant. Um, then in follow-up to that, there is also now provision made for a member of police to enter a, oh, yeah, a member of South African Police Service to enter a private dwelling for purposes of obtaining evidence. And this includes forced entry if needs be. If, they're, um, if they have received a report, um, that an offence containing an element of physical violence has allegedly been committed during an incident of domestic violence, um, they are able to then uh, gain entry into... I mean, for the courts and for, for clerks of the courts and supervisors, I think the, the most important amendments really come in, um, besides the, the recommendations, really come in in terms of protection orders. Um, so there have been a couple of proposed amendments around protection orders. Um, and if we first look at the interim protection orders, um, two of the, the, the large amendments here or proposed amendments are around the, the notification to a complainant. So upon the issuing of an interim protection order, the clerk of the court must immediately notify the complainant of the issuing of the order. But then 
as well as notifying if it is granted. The interim, if the interim order is not granted, there is also provision made that the clerk must immediately complainants. Now, one of the things that we um, that the act or the bill states is that the interim protection order application needs to be um, considered as soon as possible. It doesn't say with immediate effect or give a time limit to how soon it needs to be uh, considered. So some of the courts that, that we work with uh, still don't consider applications for interim orders on the same day of application. And this has huge ramifications for an applicant or a complainant because firstly they often need to then follow up for themselves. The burden is then on, on the complainant to follow up on their application. Um, and the, the proposed amendments now make it a provision that the complainant must be notified. And this can be done um, electronically as well. Um, but our proposal is also that applicants actually be considered on the day that the complainant notified immediately and if um, anything has to be provided a copy of the the interim order with very clear instruction that that order is no law is not in force until after service um one of the the other introductions of proposed additions um, to in in terms of the application for protection orders is provisions made for out of hours applications and here we see that the bill makes provision for an electronic application procedure outside of sorry there seems to be a mic that is cut on it's a little bit difficult to see huh? Uh, and then what is the source of I'll try and speak um, um, Hi, Karen. Um, can you please unmute yourself? Oh, apologies. I think I was muted when um when everybody was muted. Um, all right. So uh, where. I think I was muted when I was speaking about out of hours applications. Is that correct? That's correct, Karen. You can continue from there. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. So, um, so previously, um, under the Domestic Violence Act, as it stands now, is there were provisions made for out of hours applications, but it was it really required a a magistrate on on call or somebody to to come out to a police station to try and um, then do the application, but it wasn't something that was very accessible or um, or was very 
or successfully accessed, should I say. Um, the current bill now makes provision for out-of-hours applications to be made using an electronic application procedure. Um, so this would really make it possible where we see the majority of instances of domestic violence being reported is usually over weekends or, or at night where the courts are not open. So this really is a very welcome um, proposed amendment. We're hoping that it will remain in the bill and it's it really allows for, for people to make those those applications at the time of the incidents and be be considered um, at the earliest um, convenience of the courts. Then um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, right, then if we look at some of the proposed amendments in terms of the terms in the order, so in the, the bill now makes the proposed amendments that an applicant's home and work address must not be included unless required in the terms of the order. And this also extends to cases where there are children involved or an application is brought on behalf of a minor where addresses should not be included. Um, and then there is also the proposed amendment to prohibit um, the respondent from attending or being around a complainant's place of study before it really spoke to a place of residence or a place of work, but this has now been extended to a place of study. And as we know, there are um, quite a few instances of violence that we've seen on campuses or in tertiary institutions. So this is also a very welcome um, addition. One of the things just to, to note um, when we're looking at the, um, the bill, the bill currently makes provision for uh, to prohibit the respondents from entering the shared residence. Um, and just one of the things that was flagged for us is that this could be seen in conflict with the provincial, prevention of illegal eviction legislation. So we would make a proposal if we want this to be of greatest benefit to victims of violence, we, we would propose that there is, um, there is amendment to say that the Domestic Violence Act would take precedence <clears throat> over this and other acts that would prohibit um, this term being included in the order. Right, then if we look at the, the courts, we know that, um, so I, I get very excited about this because it's something that as um, as activists in the, the domestic violence space we've been looking at for a while is the introduction of an electronic repository. Um, so the bill makes provision for an integrated electronic repository for domestic violence protection orders and related matters. And this will really allow for electronic storage and access to information across the criminal justice system. Now we know, um, I don't know how many clerks are, are with us on the call, um, but I've, I've worked with, with a number of clerks across courts and I know what it's like for, for clerks to be able to need to, when, when a, an applicant comes or a complainant comes, says I need a copy of my order and needing to go and locate the file and then go and, and make copies, this will really remove that administrative burden from, from the courts. And, but it also makes these, these records freely available across courts across the country. So this is incredibly exciting um, and something that we, we most definitely support. Now, the bill is what, what makes this bill also quite different to the previous um, domestic or the current Domestic Violence Act, it's not previous yet, um, is that the bill really starts focusing on other stakeholders. Um, before the, the current bill, is very heavily focused on the Department of Justice and the Department of, oh, sorry, the Department of Police, so South African Police Services, uh, where now it is expanded. It's expanded to include Department of Health, Department of Justice, as well as even looking at um, Department of Education and other stakeholders that work um, or have some form of duty when it comes to domestic violence. So, to 
to direct these services, there are going to be directives and regulations that will be published once this bill is finalized. And part of that will also be specific directives for clerks of the courts. Um, and that basically the bill then makes provision for these directives to be specified for all relevant departments, including the clerks of the courts. Um, and then finally, just a note on offences. Um, so what the bill also does is it does speak to minimum um, sentences of, or um, I think I'm getting the word slightly wrong. Um, if it would be um, conviction and um, imprisonment terms. So under offences, there is now looking at what the minimum um, imprisonments or fines would be if there is, um, sorry, if there is um, contravention um, of any of the orders imposed. Uh, and that can be seen in, in section 17, but it really breaks it down from first offender to second or subsequent offenses. Um, so for um, for me, those are sort of the, the main amendments. As I said, I invite, I know Praise and Yaki and, and Lizelle as well, you've been part of the, um, the build drafting process. So um, I invite you to add any any additions that you want to to include. Um, but for now, I would say those are the, the main amendments. Um, yeah. So if we want to open it up to to questions and answers. OK, colleagues, um, we're going to start the question answers session now. Thank you so much to Karen for um, the information that you provided so far. Um, if there are any questions, please post them in the, 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 the chat box and we're not able to obviously give everybody an opportunity. But if there is someone who'd like to um, sort of maybe start off with a round of questions, um, if you can maybe just um, post them in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for some of the information to be posted, um, Karen, I just wanted to find out um, specifically with regards to your information that you provided on the repository. Um, so just to um, inform some of the colleagues, we've had the situation before where we, we, we may have had a perpetrator offend in one jurisdiction and then, um, you know, they go to another jurisdiction and um, then, you know, we're not able to pick up past um, sort of um, um, offences of or, 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 or circumstances of domestic violence where a protection order may have been issued against a particular complainant. And then the perpetrator either reoffends again in another jurisdiction against the same complainant or against someone else. Um, are you saying that through this repository, if the amendment goes through as is, pick up um, sort of the history of that particular perpetrator in relation to domestic violence? If you could maybe just give some information on that, please. Um, yeah, thank you for that uh, question. Um, so in my understanding, the way that it is currently termed, it would be a, a storage and amendment and um, a storage um, facility, a cloud based storage facility, but that there would also be access granted to specific members within the criminal justice system. So I'm just looking for the actual um, wording so that I don't implicate myself. So give me one second. Um, I'm just going to get it where it is in the actual um, act. So, um, so what the 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 current um, the current language in the bill states that there would be an establishment of an integrated electronic repository for domestic violence protection orders and related matters and that it needs to be established and maintained by the minister the minister will designate a fit and proper person with due regard um, to administer the electronic repository and access to the integrated repository may in the prescribed manner be granted to officials in the criminal justice system for the purposes of complying with any obligation under this act so it is um it would be um sorry it would be only 
for purposes of the Domestic Violence Act. But the way that I would understand it is that it would be available to cross-reference um, uh, between courts and within the criminal justice system. So, for instance, if we also have um, if we also have applications, so we, we see a lot of counter applications as well in the courts, but you would have someone who maybe an application is not granted. So a counter application that's brought by the respondent is not granted in the same court and they then go to a, a different court. They should be, at least my understanding of the repository, they would be able to be able to cross reference to see that that application was made or there is another application because in the in the act there is also provision made for to establish at the time of application whether there is a counter application so i think the electronic repository would assist with um, establishing that all right thanks for that karen um, can you also maybe um, just um, while we're waiting for more questions to be included on the um, chat box, could you maybe um, could we maybe open up the discussion um, with regards to what you mentioned earlier um, in relation to the compulsory reporting, especially um, you know for um, yourself um, yourselves yeah. as part of the organisation that assists victims? Um, you said you'd like us to discuss that during the session. Do you maybe just want to um, sort of kickstart that again, please? And then I'll just check um, the chat box to see if there are any more questions for us to continue with thereafter. Sure. Um, so in terms of the mandatory reporting, um, where we have a really where we where we really struggling with the the issue of mandatory reporting is that we completely support the mandatory reporting of domestic violence or other forms of violence against children and that is already contained within the children's act and um, that there is a duty to report on on both what is being called here functionaries but also on um, an ordinary adult um, to report so that's something that we we do support we also further um, support the mandatory reporting against uh, well for um, older persons and those with disabilities and again that's already set out in parallel legislation um, where we where we really are are struggling with mandatory reporting is the placing a duty to report upon all citizens, um, and this this really comes down to because of the risk of criminalisation, but it could also criminalise the victims of domestic violence themselves um, and those who try to assist them. So, and and. When we look at domestic violence, we know that currently domestic violence, unless it is um, physical violence, which is then a, or sexual violence, which is then a criminal offence, the the victim of violence and those who assist are at greater risk of being criminalised and guilty of an offence than the person who actually perpetrates violence and is the respondent in the matter. Um, so that is um, is something that that we we are currently struggling with in terms of how how is that justified in in a victim centered uh, piece of legislation. Um, so we're really and and then also saying that as someone who is a um, someone who is trying to assist a victim of violence that is an ordinary um, adult they they themselves are not liable to a, a regulation body who has the um sort of the the obligation already to to assist and report um so we just feel that this is really going to limit the help seeking spaces for victims of violence All right, Karen. Then um, there's just this, a, a, a few questions that I've popped up. I'm going to give. I'm yeah. just going to sort of discuss um, three of them. Um, so the first one is: um, Can hospitals um, or police stations not 
um, mm -hmm. sort of make a facility available um, to enable the victim to lodge a complaint there. I know you you mentioned something about electronic or, or online. Mm -hmm. Um, can you maybe just give us a little bit of information on that? And then um, just before we continue um, with you answering the question, um, maybe if we can just deal with, with three and then we can go back to the yeah. rest. Um, then also, um, I think it was from um, Kadir, um, the DV Act um, taking precedence of other legislation you you specifically refer to the prior legislation with regards to eviction um, if you could maybe just clarify that again um, you spoke about that in respect to um, the, the the respondent entering the shared residence and that that um, 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 provision might not be given effect to if it is passed um, because of the conflicting legislation so if you can just clarify that again and then the last one for for this round would be um, if the complainant's contacts are not revealed, um, as you've explained, you know, when it's a child or um, the complainant's address or work um, or um, sort of place of study information, how will the respondent know uh, to serve papers on the complainant? So um, if you could maybe just deal with those three questions first, please, and then we'll continue from there. Thanks, Karen. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that. So um, in terms of police and hospitals, I think that's a really great a really great suggestion and if the if the provision or if the proposed amendment for electronic submissions is passed and does become part of the bill then i and and as well as having additional um, stakeholders included in the bill i think it's something that can definitely be put in the directives or the regulations attached to the bill and then have those facilities available through police and hospitals um, that's, I, but for now, as it stands in the bill, that electronic submission process would only be for for applications outside of regular court hours. So that would just need to be kept in mind um, in that suggestion. Um, and also, if if the bill goes through the way that it is now, there would also be duty to report on those functionaries um, in in hospitals and then also police. Then the, the, the comments I made on domestic, the Domestic Violence um, Act, as it would be uh, once amended, um, over other forms of legislation was in terms of the protection of illegal evictions, because when there is an order granted under the Domestic Violence Act that the respondents cannot gain, should not gain access or enter what was the shared residence, um, the the danger that we foresee is that the uh, PI legislation would take precedence. So would say, but if the person is not allowed access to or entering the, the shared residence, then is that not a form of eviction? Um, so that's where we we just raising a couple of flags around that. And if we are serious about a respondent not being able to enter that shared residence, then we need to say that the Domestic Violence Act should take precedence over PI legislation, at least until the, the final granting of the protection order. Um, and then in terms of the complainant's contact details, um, I'm not 100% sure um, what what the the procedure would be in terms of not having the the contact details in the notice my my thinking would be is that the court itself would have those contact details but that they wouldn't be put in a in the actual notice or the interim order that is served on the respondents. And if we move to an electronic repository, that information would be available for the uh, peace officer or the sheriff who is responsible for serving um, serving papers. But there is also um, there was also um, discussion as well around electronic um, submission of notice. So if that is the case, then they wouldn't be, it wouldn't necessarily require a residential address. All right, thank you for that, Karen. Um, and then also, um, just um, another question that came up, um, um, if, if, if it's all right with you, I'll maybe just deal with that and we can have some of the, the other colleagues maybe just responding as well. It was with regards to electronic tracing and um, the, the um, question was, was basically, 
um, how um, will we be able to trace um, the suspect or the perpetrator or the respondent if the complainant does not know who the perpetrator is um, um, then it you know it can't be said to be DB so um, like with and I'm, I'm sorry I don't know um, specifically which um, sector you come from if it's from government justice or if it's from the NGO sector um, but when it comes to um, offences that are perpetrated or um, in relation to the domestic violence and what the scope of the domestic violence circumstances are where you would apply for a protection order, obviously you have to name a particular perpetrator, otherwise you can't get an interim order or a protection, final protection order against that particular person. It's the same way an offence was committed. In order for you to report the offence and for the offence to actually um, you know, make it onto the court roll, um, or if that matter to make it onto the court roll, um, then you would need to identify a perpetrator. They would have to be an accused linked to that particular offence. So unfortunately, if there is no perpetrator, um, then we would not be able to, um, you know, uh, have an incident of domestic violence reported um, through the scope of the Domestic Violence Act. You can still be reported to, to the police if you have a description, um, you know, but specifically for within the ambit of the of the domestic violence legislation. Um, Karen, I don't know if you want to maybe um, add on to that. Uh, no, I think that's yeah, I think that's is that suffices. All right, then then Karen, um, I haven't seen any more questions that have been posted. I'll I'll check in a moment, but just um, whilst I'm checking that, if you could maybe just um sort of explain to um, um, those of us um, being a part of the session today. Um, have you had any experience um, whilst working, um, you know, with Mosaic, either um, sort of personally or, um, you know, through colleagues that have dealt with um, our victims of domestic violence abuse, um, of spiritual abuse? Maybe just to give um, um, us an idea of how do you think um, this will play out if, you know, the amendment does go through um, once the bill is passed? And how would we sort of be expected to deal with um, an incidence of or incidents or circumstances? circumstances of spiritual abuse mm. so we've actually we've actually had instances of spiritual abuse in in a number of ways the one is actually around um prohibiting someone from practicing their chosen um, religion um, and that would really be about just preventing them from either attending um, spiritual gatherings or removing religious texts or anything that they could possibly use to practice um, their, their spirituality. Um, so that's something that we, we have seen quite a bit. But then we have also, um, we've also seen quite a, a bit of the use of religion or religious texts or um, spiritual beliefs to actually um, entrench the um, or to justify the violence. Um, and this is often used in um, using the, the person's religious or spiritual beliefs to manipulate or shame them um, and using religious texts to to actually try and minimize the or rationalize the, the abusive behaviors. That's the, the large portion of the, the spiritual abuse that we see and um, how we will um, how we will deal with that um, or how we will approach it if the bill is passed. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. I think I think it also it does fit in with um, issues of emotional and psychological abuse. Um, so I think it would be sort of a similar order that would be made or terms that would be made in the order. Um, yeah, but I, but I think that the main thing for us is around when it, when it comes to spiritual abuse, for it to be acknowledged as such, because often what we find is that um, as well, you would have individuals who, who would go to their, their spiritual, um, whether it be a pastor, an imam, um, a rabbi, or a, even a, a traditional leader would sort of go and say, I'm experiencing this, and then spirituality be used to justify it. So it sort of comes from, from both the, the respondent side as well as the, the spiritual leader's side. Okay, thanks very much for that clarification, Karen. Um, just another question, um, you know, that um, Jean posted um, in the chat was, so um, we're 
obviously wanting to empower victims of domestic violence, um, you know, through whatever processes. So if a victim does not want to report and somebody else um, is compelled through this legislation to report on their behalf, um, how would that affect, you know, sort of empowerment in relation to that particular victim? You know, how would you, uh, you know, how would you suggest we deal? Well, it wouldn't, it, it would negatively affect the empowerment of the victim and it could also land up um, inflicting secondary victimization or secondary trauma on that victim, especially because we know that someone who comes out to report or seek help for domestic violence is sometimes, has sometimes waited four, five, sometimes 10 years to actually come out and speak out about this this violence and then to be told well now i'm going to have to go and report this to the social worker or the police um it doesn't empower that that survivor at all um and and so that's why we we're really advocating for that to be removed completely we don't believe that there should be mandatory reporting for adults and um, for adults um adults who are experiencing domestic violence. Uh, we we also, as I said, we support the, the reporting of, of violence against children, persons with disabilities and older persons, because that's already, it's already available in parallel legislation. But the mandatory reporting against any adult, I think, removes all agency from a victim, of, from a survivor of violence. But it also places, um, it places huge strain on on those around that person. Um, I'm also seeing that that John's raised an issue around like what does this mean for shelters who are supporting victims of domestic violence? Well, what it would mean is that a social worker working in that shelter would need to then amend their confidentiality agreement with with their clients to say, well, you know, I know that you're here and whether you would like to or not, I have to report um, to a department social worker and to the police um, to say that you you have experienced domestic violence. So it really impacts on a victim-centered um, approach to domestic violence services because it removes the agency. It's not empowering. So then.